Happy New Year, everybody, and welcome to the first installment of Season 5 of My Dad Listens to This. I'm Juliet the Daughter. And I'm Kevin the Dad. Five seasons. Yeah, I can't believe it's been five years since we started this. I think we've, it's fair to say we've grown a lot since we did our first ever episode. I hope so. I like to think so. Listeners who have been with us a long time, please let us know uh, what you think of our progress so far. But because this is Season 5, we wanted the number 5 to be involved somehow, so today we're talking about... The Japanese group, Pizzicato 5. So, Dad, what do we need to know? You've heard of K-pop? Yes. This is J-pop. And I've heard of J-pop, too. Okay, mm -hmm. good. Well, anyway, Pizzicato 5 started as the brainchild of university students Yasuharu Kanishi and Keitaro Takanami, who met at a local music society meeting in 1979. Over the ensuing years, they managed to recruit three more members, including Mamiko Sasaki as the band's first vocalist. Their first single was a 12-inch, The Audrey Hepburn Complex, hmm. followed by their debut album, Pizzicato 5 in Action, on Techiku Records' non-standard label. In 1986, P5 signed with Sony, CBS slash Sony, now Sony Music Entertainment Japan. They released their major label debut, Couples, which did not do well. The label wanted them to find a new singer, by which time Mamiko Sasaki had quit. Takeo Tajima joined P5 as the new singer, whilst also fronting his other band, Original Love. This iteration put out three albums, which did... Eh. Tajima decided to just concentrate on Original Love. Enter Maki Nomiya. She had put out a solo album in 1981 and was also the lead vocalist for the band Portable Rock in the 80s. In 1991, this version of P5 signed with Nippon Columbia. They put out three EPs showcasing Maki's vocals and put out the album This Year's Girl. That album was inspired by the advent of sampling, and the song the group came up with would lead to the founding of the Shibuya K scene. Shibuya K, which means Shibuya style, is a subgenre of J-pop. Shibuya itself is a ward in Tokyo known for its restaurants, bars, bookstores, and record shops and boutiques. It was the epicenter for Tokyo fashion, nightlife, and youth culture. Shibui K merged, fused, melded 60s style Western pop music, bossa nova, jazz, funk, lounge, French yi, -yi soul, just put it all in a blender. Musicologist Mori Yoshitaka wrote that Shibui K was a product of consumerism, and I agree with that. Hmm. This is like music you'd hear in upscale shopping boutiques. Yeah. More on that later. So P5 finally found their sound and perfect combination. The band was getting bigger to the point that American indie label Matador put out an EP in July 1994, 5x5, five five, which is, yes, five songs by Pizzicato 5, including, including the bizarre, obscure, Burt Backrack Hal David song, Me Japanese Boy. Uh-oh. Which uh. tongue firmly planted in cheek when P5 did their version. I kid you not. In October 1994, Matador released Made in USA, a compilation album made up of songs from This Year's Girl, Sweet Pizzicato 5, and Bossa Nova 2001. Around this time, Takaro Takanami left the band, reducing the band to now just Maki and Yasuharu. Matador put out a second compilation album, The Sound of Music by Pizzicato 5, in 1995. After that, P5 would simultaneously release their albums in Japan and the USA. In 2001, Pizzicato 5 announced they were breaking up. Prior to the breakup, they did a series of concerts featuring appearances by old band members. These days, both Yasuharu Kanishi and Keitaro Takanami are record producers. Maki no Miya still puts out solo albums and also, no surprises here, is a fashion model and dress designer. P5 has been eligible for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame since 2009. And if Japan already has their own version, I bet they're in it already. Mm. As for me, Mike was responsible for introducing me to Pizzicato 5. He had made in the USA and insisted on playing the Twiggy song for me. <laughs> he let me borrow his copy and I got my own eventually. I also picked up The Sound of Music, which this is going to sound strange, but it's one of my favorite design CD packages, hence the consumerism. Yeah. Oh, and, and the music's actually pretty good too. And after that, I picked up and resold or donated Happy End of the World in the International Playboy and Playgirl record. In Made in USA, the booklet focuses almost exclusively on Maki no Mia. 
There's one page at the beginning with 42 different pictures of her, and this page is also repeated at the booklet's end, which leads me to the question, which one's the real Maki? Are we not meant to know? And does it even matter? Mm. <clears throat> also, for credits, it just lists the three members. It doesn't mention who's playing what. Mm. And there are various instruments on this album, from accordion to vibes. Mm -hmm. Are we not meant to know? Does it even matter? It does include sampling credits, though. Which, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, which, which bands were just starting to do at that time, so they wouldn't get sued. Yeah, understandable. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, the lyrics are in both Japanese and English. And with the English ones, there seems to be something lost in translation, as we're about to find out. Mm. Oh, also the lyrics are somewhat obscure by the Matador logo. I'll both fight this cape on every page. Mm -hmm. And I had to get a magnifying glass to be able to read them in some sections. And are we not meant to know? Does it even matter? We'll get into that. Let's find out. Her song, I. You? I, no, not me. Her. I? It's I referring to her. I. Everybody got that? Okay. I must say I was pleasantly surprised by the sound of this track. A bit of bossa nova vibe going straight out of the 60s with instruments, the xylophone especially. And I must say this is the best album booklet I've ever seen. <laughs> if you don't understand Japanese, the booklet has side-by-side -side translations with the Japanese spelled out in the English alphabet with the English translation side-by-side. -side. The premise of this song is this girl saying, yeah, you may think I'm nasty and unreliable, but I can get away with everything I do because I'm cute. And while she does sound cute with her airy voice, there's also an undercurrent of seriousness and maturity. She could be a Bond girl easily, but we'll get to Bond a couple of tracks later. I found myself not caring what this song meant and just bouncing along to the music because I love the arrangement and the sound of her voice. Fun opening track. Mm -hmm. Yeah, quite a jazzy little number. Starts off with drums and bass, then an accordion joins in with piano and vibes. Catchy and kitschy. Um, lyrically, I think this is Maki's statement of purpose, which boils down to... And I'm quoting the lyrics here. Mm -hmm. Yes, I am unreliable, capricious, cheeky, willful, luxurious, affected, lying, dubious, and random. But, like you said, mm -hmm. she is allowed and loved because I am cute. What a gal. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah, I know I can get away with it, and I'll always be getting away with it. And you are not going to do anything about it. You're so weak. <laughs> like that meme of uh, Principal Skinner in The Simpsons. Pathetic. <laughs> <laughs> Next track. Sweet Soul Review. Those opening. Do, 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 do. Those are so catchy. Kind of reminded me of Motown or Soul Train backup singers. Oh, yeah. This young woman is in love, and she wants the object of her affection to partake in the happiness and joy. It reminds her of a movie musical she saw on TV where the town is always parading. Okay, the first thing that came to mind was Hello, Dolly, with Before the Parade Passes By. Or it could be 76 trombones from The Music Man. Or the marching band scene in Sweet Charity. Take your pick. Japan has an amazing musical theater scene, so it really could be any one of those. My favorite moments were when the English words unexpectedly slipped in. Maybe those happened to be the Japanese translation of those words, or they just snuck them in like Easter eggs because there was really no direct translation. And as I was listening, I thought to myself, this really doesn't feel like five minutes. And it didn't right up until the very end because I was trying to figure out how the song would wrap up. But I did enjoy myself the whole time. Well, that's good. Yeah, someone definitely knows their 60s soul. Yep. Nice rip of er homage, as the French say. <laughs> now, on top of that, it samples the drum riff from Sly and the Family Stone's Dance to the Music. Mm -hmm. And the mashup of those two songs would be so easy because a lot of sweet soul music is really just dance to the music with different words. And so they definitely had to give Sly credit for this one. Mm -hmm. And yes, you can dance to this. Mm -hmm. And lyrically... I'm going to say a little bonkers, and I'm quoting again. <laughs> In the world, there are a lot of sweet, a lot of catchy, want to hug and be glad, don't want you to press your cheek to them. Maybe nowadays the translations would be better. I'll chalk it up to Lost in Translation. Yeah. It kind of sounds clunky. So let me ask you something. What? With foreign language songs, do we really want a translation, or does that take away something from the listening experience? Like you said with the first song, I... You didn't care what they were saying. You just enjoyed the music mm -hmm. and the singing without knowing what was what it was about. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe it's also for me. It's like if the music is crap, I'm like, okay, what the hell do the lyrics mean then? Because there's got to be something redeeming here. Interesting. Yeah. And also Interesting. it's like, I want a good translation. 
That way I can understand a little bit. I feel like now, in the age of Netflix, where you can get dubs and subs of any language pretty easily on any streaming channel, I think if they were to re-release this album now, they could easily do a re-translation of the lyrics with a better translator, 100%. Well, I'm going to go off on the translation towards the end of our, uh, okay. end of our podcast. Um, as for the soundbite, the new stereophonic sound spectacular. Mm-hmm. That would come back to hilariously haunt P5 on the next Matador compilation. Really? Really. We gonna get into why? Or no? Uh, if we ever do the album somewhere down the road. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Next track, Magic Carpet Ride. I can, <laughs> I can sum up the vibe of this song in one word. Bollywood. Oh, yeah. With the bongo drums, the chimes, the use of strings, and the woodwind instrument solo, it sounded more like something from India than Japan. And there is a romance here. We know that life is a lie and someday we'll die, but until then I want to feel the magic of our love like a magic carpet ride. And from the singing, I love how her voice is underscored by a baritone or bass singer who sings so softly, but it's the perfect touch to compliment her. And it's almost a constant throughout the song with this guy, like a bass guitar, that you kind of don't need a bass instrument here. I once again find myself just slow jamming along and loving every minute of it. They're great at making songs you can just vibe and exist to. Mm-hmm. Our first, our first English language song. Mm-hmm. And guess what? The lyrics are not stilted. Mm-hmm. They're pretty straightforward. Mm-hmm. And like you said, their love is like a magic carpet ride. Mm-hmm. Groovy. It's kind of like hip-hop Aladdin, yeah. if you will. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that got that catchy line, magic carpet ride, magic carpet ride. Cha-cha-cha. <laughs> and for me, the song has, and I'm not making this up, I've heard this style of music before, a trip hop Indian vibe to it. Oh, okay. Right down to the sitar, percussion, and shanai, the Indian horn. Yep. Or what sounds like a shanai because I was listening really closely and I couldn't tell if it was an actual horn or if it was a keyboard. Oh, okay. It's just so close. And in the middle comes that monster orchestral break. Yep, yep. Played backwards. Really? Really. That's kind of awesome. If you listen to it, it just sounds so nuts. And I thought, oh. It's being played backwards. That's why it sounds like it does. And it makes it sound more Eastern, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I know there's like something to do with like, there's definitely a difference between Eastern music and Western music. I I don't know if it has to do with time signature Mm -hmm. or approach. I cannot remember what it is, but I know there's a big there's one component that makes it a huge difference. Well, also, um, Ethan from Sideways, he did a video talking about why the music in Ghibli movies is so relaxing. And he said, oh, what was it? That in Japanese music, they have a different form of like the base of like a scale than we do here or something. Mm-hmm. It's very interesting. If you can watch that video essay, go, go listen to it. All right, next track, Ready Made FM. So what's the point of this track considering it's only 13 seconds? I don't know, but I think I can tell you what is the precursor to lo-fi hip-hop beats for study lo-fi hip-hop is a genre of music that became popular on youtube in the 2010s it is a form of down-tempo music that combines sound bites from hip-hop with chill out music it was introduced in the rap scene in america in the early 2000s and kicked off into high gear when these live streams emerged on youtube in 2013. nowadays their most popular is background music for when you're studying or working I know so because I played that music in the background while studying for my methodology final my sophomore year of college. You listen to these 13 seconds and it feels like a snippet of these videos, which is also interesting because the art for those live streams is mostly drawn in the style of Japanese anime. So maybe Pizzicato 5 left a musical impact in a unique way with one small track they didn't realize. Just food for thought. Well, you got a lot more out of this song than I did. Yeah. You know, said just 14 seconds. But I just looked at it as a bit of a preview for a later song on here, I Want to Be Like You. Okay. Next track, Baby Love Child. Definitely one of the weirder ones so far. There's this short little musical burst that was unsettling, but in a good way, because it was so markedly different from the other tracks that I quite liked it. Then there's a bit of hip-hop remix going on in the middle where this American voice says, Attention adults, over and over, Mm. behind a vocalese, which might indicate that you're supposed to pay attention to the music and be hypnotized into loving this woman who wants you to need her forever and ever. A different sound that's interesting, but not one that grabbed me. Its uniqueness doesn't really leave a lasting impression once the novelty wears off. Mm -hmm. Um, This is the second and last English song on this collection. Samples James Brown's funky drummer, as almost every other song in the 80s or early 90s did. 
uncredited, of course, just like every other 80s and 90s song that used it. And I swear, I swear they lifted the bass line from You Lost That Love and Feeling. Phil Spector easily could have sued and won. But he didn't, and, and now, now he he's can't. Dead. <laughs> and then that middle with attention adults repeated over and over. I don't know what that's supposed to mean, but I will go with your theory. Um, I did a search to see if I could find where that snippet came from. Couldn't find anything? But Google did come up with articles on attention-seeking adults. Oh, okay. Not what I was looking for, but I learned a few things. Um, this is not a bad song. It's not my favorite, but it's not bad because, I mean, I've never skipped over it when it comes on. Next track, Twiggy versus <clears throat> James Bond. The songwriters really did their homework here by capturing the sound of 60s spy movie scores with drums and bass guitar and percussion and a moment with the strings that sound like V to a kill. You can hear it if you go back and listen mm -hmm. to it. So this girl is waiting for three hours with her cat when she gets a phone call and she feels like pretty skinny twiggy in a miniskirt. I don't know why it's her versus James Bond. Maybe there's some sort of juxtaposition of her bubbliness with the drama of a James Bond score. I have no idea, but I really enjoy the music here. And I wonder how big a deal Twiggy was in uh, Japan, considering she has a song named after her. But Japanese fans are passionate about their idols, so if Twiggy was an icon over there, then she was certainly loved. Fun Japanese tribute to two British icons. Mm -hmm. This samples and mashes up Lalo Schifrin's bass line from The Man from Thrush. And he was better known for doing the theme, writing the theme for Mission Impossible, huh. which I don't know if you've ever heard it, but... Yeah, I have. Everyone's heard um, that theme. So it mashes up The Man from Thrush and The Ventures Hawaii Five-0. And it works. Mm -hmm. Now, The Man from Thrush was an episode of The Man from Uncle, which was a 60s spy series, oh. which ran from 1964 to 1968. That was remade into a movie with Henry Cavill. Right. Uncle stood for... United Network Command for Law and Enforcement. Thrush stood for Technological Hierarchy for the Removal of Undesirables in the Subjugation of Humanity. Ugh, that sounds imperialist as all hell. I, I think we can blame, like, Spectre in the James Bond movies for this. Like, like mm -hmm. every bad guy organization... Has an acronym. And completely random, but you know you want to know this... SHIELD stands for Strategic Homeland Intervention Enforcement and Logistics Division. Originally, it was Supreme Headquarters, comma, International Espionage and Law Enforcement Division. In both cases, though, we don't know what it's a division of. Hmm. Anyway, as for Twiggy, that's Dame Twiggy to you since 2019, Leslie Hornby was one of the first international supermodels. She was everywhere. In the 60s. Mm -hmm. I mean, every, everywhere. She's done singing, mm -hmm. acting. She mm -hmm. was on Broadway in My One and Only with Tommy Toon. Cool. She had a, and she has a podcast, Tea with Twiggy. And, has on, and she's on all the usual social platforms. Mm, yeah, obviously. And again, bonkers English lyrics. <laughs> the deathless chorus translates to, Wear Twiggy's miniskirt, poses Twiggy. Wear Twiggy's miniskirt. Skinny me, look like Twiggy. None of it makes sense. No. Nope. But it's catchy. Mm -hmm. It's so catchy. Next track? This yes, year's Lance. this year's girl number two. Okay, here mm. we have basically a dating questionnaire set to music. And I enjoyed it because I've never heard someone talking in an interview with background music and putting it on an album before. We go through her likes and dislikes as she answers questions put to her by a man. Every now and then we hear a woman say, strange, to some of the answers as the music cuts out. And, to be honest, some of the answers are strange. For example, what did you eat for breakfast this morning? Oxygen, which would make me worried about an eating disorder. But again, this reminded me of lo-fi hip-hop beat music because sometimes those have inspirational messages that are spoken in these same hushed tones. Not close enough to the listener's ear to be ASMR, but still intimate. And I really enjoyed the experience. I hope she finds the man she's looking for. <laughs> Yeah, so basically this track is an interview with Maki Nuriyama. We learn such vitals as favorite designer, lipstick, foundation, and perfume. Now, are these real answers or was this a script somebody wrote for them to speak in a studio together? I don't know. Hmm. This version is in Japanese. You can get the English version on the EP 5x5, which was oh. released a few months prior to this album. And most of the answers are pretty much the same. There are some, though, that have been changed. So oh. you can do a, 
a compare and contrast. Interesting. And you can definitely chill to this. Absolutely. And I swear, the sample of the woman saying strange mm -hmm. is Laura Nero. And I would have to go through my best of by her to be 100% sure, but I am 99% sure that it's her. Okay. Next track, I Want to Be Like You. Not not the Jungle Book song, To if anyone's confused. Not Louis Prima. No. This song could be about a few things. Catfishing, being two-faced, or lies that the beauty industry markets towards women. Someone who is beautiful but lies and is cold-hearted, and yet this girl wants to be like them. Which kind of took me back to middle school with the poisonous beauty queens who are absolutely cruel and trashy. But you wanted to be them because at least they were pretty and popular. Now, I am so glad I didn't end up like them. So kids, take a lesson from me. You don't need to be like them. Be yourself and know you're goddamn gorgeous. And that's kind of all I got here. Okay, I want to be like you. No, you don't. Mm -mm. It's too stressful. Uh, Maki's object, object of affection is beautiful. Eyes, lips, even the voice telling a lie. And for me, this song is like, it's more, it's definitely more time to chill because you must be tired from all that shopping. So mm. have a seat and take a load off. Yeah. Next track, Go Go Dancer. She doesn't want love. She wants to have fun and dance the whole night long. Probably the most mm. 70s disco on the album so far, mm -hmm. which is absolutely perfect for dancing. And since I was listening to this song on New Year's Eve day, dancing till midnight felt really appropriate. However, I will say the one part of the song that freaked me out was the scream that would pop up every now oh, and then yeah, in the background. Yeah. It sounded like a zoo animal. Very fun, but I think they're better with 60s dance pop than 70s disco. The 70s sound seemed almost too serious for the singer, even though the music was incredible. Not what I listened to for fun, but if this played on, a dan at the dan on the dance floor at a party, I'd get up and dance 100%. And even sitting down and listening to it, you're jamming and bobbing your head the whole time. Mm -hmm. Now this samples the turtles... And I am not making this up. I'm King Kamanawanalea. Wear the royal macadamia nuts. <laughs> so that's not just a line from Grumpy Old Men. I've been to Hawaii. Where? Kamanawanalea. Yeah. So anyway, like I said, it's I'm King Kamanawanalea. Wear the royal macadamia nuts. Which has one of the funkiest drum beats ever. And I never thought I would ever use the words turtles and funky in the same sentence. <laughs> It's amazing. It's a really short song. I found it on YouTube. It's just all this drum beat and the turtle singing. I'm king. Come on, I want to lay you in the background. We're the royal macadamia nuts. And that's all there really is to it. Wow. Um, and it also samples the horns Do -do 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 from the god awful oh. Lucretia McEvil by the equally god awful. Blood, sweat, and tears. You've heard of BTS? Yeah, the, the K-pop group. This is this was BST. <laughs> <clears throat> and when I heard it, I thought, how did I miss this band on our Dave Barry episode? Oh, uh, were they in Dave Barry's book? I think he had mentioned them for a song. I can't remember which one. Okay. But, oh, man, what a what a pile of turd to, to shovel through on that with that band. Anyway, <laughs> I only listened to half of that six minute plus song be before I said the hell with it because listeners, I love you, but only so much. Mm -hmm. Ugh, and just the title, Lucretia McEvil. Why, guys? Yeah. Oh, yeah, because Cruella DeVille was already taken. <laughs> Dodie Smith's estate should sue anyway. Who's Dodie Smith? She wrote 101 Dalmatians. Oh, yeah, yeah, the author. Yep. Next. Anyway, Maki just wants to dance with this guy. Nothing else, except he gets friend-zoned at the end. Yeah. He does. Mm -hmm. But she and the five keep it catchy. Yeah, they're having a good time while he's just walking away sad like the end of the Hulk TV show. Dun, 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 dun. Dun, 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 dun. Next track. It's a lonely life. Catchy. Catchy? Catchy. Catchy, catchy. Seven minutes long. Will it feel like it? I will say, if I hadn't had the English lyrics up next to me, this would have gone by a lot slower, as I would have had no idea what she's saying. And sure, sometimes that doesn't matter, but when you know a track's going to be seven minutes, it kind of helps. The story is of this chic girl who fell in love and got burned. But joke's on whoever dumped her, because she's got big plans and is moving on to bigger and better things. She's going to be on TV, she's got a new look, and she's going to meet up with a man. Yet underneath that... There's the insecurity with her noticing the delivery girl is prettier than her and asking if she'll be called on tonight. And yet, even with her doubts, she knows that her name is the one that'll be called out in the middle of the night. 
very sultry and very interesting. Hmm. But do we need a re? Do we need the lyrics to repeat for a second time? I, I don't think so. Okay. Mm-hmm. Speaking of catchy, yes, this song does live up to the title. And the band loves that word for some reason. Mm-hmm. It pops up a lot. Mm-hmm. Everything's catchy. Sweet chocolate, that's hard to get. Mm-hmm. Midnight shopping. Mm-hmm. Smell of money. Mm-hmm. Someone's been reading their F. Scott Fitzgerald. Mm-hmm. Uh, the new shop that accepts a credit card. Very, oh, yeah. Very catchy. Mm-hmm. Brand new clothes. Brand new lover. Brand new dance. Brand new gossip. Maybe they mean hip instead of catchy or trendy. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Anyway, this song is mostly a drum sample with occasional bass. Yes. And Catchy spawned a sequel, Sophisticated Catchy, which is on 1995's Matador compilation, The Sound of Music. Does it pick up where the story left off? Well, no, it's just Maki saying the word catchy over and over and over and Mm -hmm. over Mm -hmm. for a few minutes, backed by a propulsive beat, a complete 180 of this version. Hmm. Final track, Peace Music. I'm surprised this hasn't been used in the opening of a romance anime. I think it would be perfect for the opening credits. I could I yeah. could see that. And this song is also perfect for New Year's, as it also sounds like a resolution to love each other forever. Almost like Japanese hippies, especially with the mentions of Aquarius, the Bluebird, and Love Lasting for 2,000 Years. Cute and fluffy with a meaningful message, but not one on the album I've listened to over and over. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, with a title like that, this is P5's hippie song, right down to the bead necklace that's mentioned in the lyrics. Mm-hmm. It's a funky summer of love with a piano figure that, to me, is an interpolation of the Beatles' Hey Bulldog. Paul and Yoko, call your lawyers. <laughs> On the Sound of Music, there's a horrible remix of this song by, done by Saint Etienne. The only track off that album that I did not download. It is just... It's like if you had a headache... <laughs> This would make that headache last even longer. Oh, no. It's just, it's just terrible. That's a bummer. But yeah, it's kind of like, like you said, I, I could definitely see it working for an anime romance. And, you know, mm-hmm. it's, it's a little cute with like, it definitely checks off all the summer of love stuff that you'd have on a mm-hmm. summer of love checklist if you were so inclined. Or playlist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Overall, I was pleasantly surprised by Pizzicato 5. Their musicianship is amazing because it shows they've done their homework in terms of researching pop culture and musical styles of the past. If you're looking to get into J-pop, this album is a good stepping stone, stepping stone since it's marketed for the U.S. specifically. Give this album a spin and also maybe get ready to dance. Yeah. All right. And now for an existential crisis. What? <laughs> what? What? What the hell? Okay. I'll go okay. See it, I guess. This is just all me. So lyrically, these lyrics are not deep. At all. No, they're it's, not. It's all surface. And you don't have to be deep in order to make music. If you want depth, listen to Bob Dylan. Mm-hmm. And I don't mean to be that dismissive, but this is the first time I ever focused on Made in USA's lyrics. Mm-hmm. And I've had this CD since 1994. What are we in now? 2023. Oh, my Lord. So we're talking 29 years Yeah. of having this CD. And this is the first time I was ever compelled or had a reason to focus on the lyrics. Mm -hmm. It's just always been background music to me. And after this episode, it'll go back to being that. Which is maybe the band's intention. Like I said earlier, Shibuya K was a product of consumerism. So maybe that's all this is. Music to shop by. Disposable income meets disposable music. Oh, ouch, that's harsh. But I get what you mean. Music or Muzak for the hip crowd as opposed to the hipsters. Mm. And this reminded me of an incident um, some years ago when I went to Boston with uh, Joe Ryan. He wanted to go to um, we went Quincy Market and they had this big express store, uh-huh. clothing, upscale clothing store. Right. We go in there and there's like this French song playing and it was about Picasso and it was so freaking catchy. Oh, and you got it on cassette. They were selling cassettes of the music they were playing in the store. Yeah, it's a and good song. Of, it is. And Son of a Gun, I bought it. And Son of a Gun, I wish I could remember where I got where that cassette is. Because this reminded me of that. And I was looking. I thought this was the same band for, for so long. No. Um, um, uh, it's a French woman who does Picasso. And I cannot remember the, her name, unfortunately. It's Claudia. Something or other. Yeah, yeah. I will have to do some digging. Mm-hmm. So this all leads me to a question which I don't think has a definite answer. Mm-hmm. Should all music have meaning? 
If it doesn't, are we wasting our time listening to it? And yeah, I know there's ear candy, but even Paul Abdul is saying something in her songs, even though it's variations of I love you or don't cheat on me. Mm -hmm. And again, maybe it's the stilted translations that to me make the lyrics inert. The more I think about it, the more I wonder if it was intentional because the two English lyric songs that they do, mm -hmm. they do a really good job yeah. with, um, Meaning. with the language. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing is, like, in the booklet, it doesn't say who did the translating. Maybe it was the band, and maybe they did it that way to keep the listener at arm's length. Mm -hmm. It's like, we want you to know us, but only so much. But at a distance. Okay. Or maybe I'm just wasting brain power on something I know is all surface. Just something to be consumed, then move on. Mm -hmm. trying, to give, trying to give weight to something that's weightless. I mean, even Pete Townsend wrote, it's the singer, not the song. Mm -hmm. So I guess if you keep it tuneful and have a good singer... Maybe you've done your job. But if you're not too in full, you better write some good lyrics. And, you know, maybe that's all we can hope for is like, you know, musicians, they're just going to put out their stuff and it's up to us to, I guess, to deal with it or to live with it or to bring whatever meaning we do to it. Hmm. It's like, you know, your mom telling that story about her professor who met Robert Frost yeah. and said, hey, did you mean this, 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 and this poem? And... Robert Frost looks at the guy and says, no, but that was very clever of you. <laughs> Translation, sit down and shut up. <laughs> but the thing is, though, I love this album and I, I love the music. And yeah, I recommend you listen to the whole thing on whatever place you can find it. Mm -hmm. And as for me, I'm going to question everything in which I've ever believed. And again, I blame Bob Dylan for all this. Thanks, Mr. Voice of a Generation. Yeah, thanks, Bob. Thanks a lot. All right, on that note, as always, thank you for listening to this latest installment of My Dad Listens to This. Like, comment, subscribe, and all that jazz. Remember, the more you interact with the video, the greater of a chance we'll have of being seen on YouTube's homepage. Follow me on social media. If you follow, if you follow me there, then I just post the episodes there. And as always, if you like the episodes, feel free to leave a little donation in our Ko-Fi tip cup. And if you are friends with my dad, tell him what you want to listen to, and he will email you an episode right to your inbox. As always, thank you for listening to the latest installment of My Dad Listens to This. We'll be back next time with another album to nitpick and gripe about. Dad, anything you want to say before we sign off? Just one word. What? Catchy. <laughs>